when a mechanical failure leads to mistakes. Reverse number two. When that mistake leads to confusion. Uh, we are not slowing down. Why? These are the events that happened to S7 Airlines Flight 778. July the 9th, 2006. It's a somewhat peaceful morning over the skies of Russia as S7 Airlines Flight 778 is on its domestic flight from Moscow to Irkutsk. The flight usually takes five hours to complete. Today, this flight is operated by an Airbus Air 310-300. Thanks to its large capacity, on board there are 195 passengers with eight crew members. The A310 was Airbus's first glass cockpit, making it possible for two pilots to fly the jet alone. On this flight, at the left seat is 45-year-old Captain Sergei Gennadievich Shibanov, one of the best at this airline. At the right seat is 48-year-old co-pilot Vladimir Grigorievich Chernik, also one of the best at the airline. This specific A310 is powered by two Pratt and Whitney engines. Unfortunately, one of them, the left engine, doesn't have a working reverser. But nothing to worry about since the A310 can land with one reverser not working. The weather at Irkutsk isn't great with an overcast, low visibility and thunderstorm in the area. It will be a challenge to land. It's 7.15 local time and from here we play the cockpit first recorder and flat data recorder as the crew is about to begin their descent into Irkutsk. Before I roll the tape, please, please help a brother out with a sub. It will really mean a lot if you subscribe and I cannot do this without you. It won't take you two seconds to do that. Come on, help a brother out with a sub. Siberia 778 requesting descent. Siberian 778. Are you on emergency frequency? My mistake, Siberia 778. Siberia 778 once again requesting descent. Siberian 778 cleared for descent, 5,700 meters. What just happened? Uh, I forgot to switch the frequency, my bad. I didn't get enough sleep last night. If you are tired, you say. Don't neglect safety. Advise the cabin, please. Yes, Captain. We can't see anything at all, and we have no reverse on engine number one. Yeah, fucking reverses. Landing gear down, slots 15. Landing gear down, and slats 15. Landing check. 1.5 miles to go, an airport in sight. No, I mean landing checklist. Oh, landing checklist. Flaps 2020, lights on, landing gear down. Landing checklist completed. Tower Siberia 778 descending and landing gear extended, ready for landing. Autopilot off. Siberian 778, cleared to land runway 30, beware of gusting winds. 500. Cleared to land, Siberia 778. 400. So less than one mile away, landing normal. 300. You are slightly to the left, yes? Yes, correcting. 100. 50, 40, 30, 20, retard. 
Reverse number two. Braking. Siberia 778, we have landed. Siberian 778, vacate to the left on taxiway 6. Taxiway 6, 778. Uh, we are not slowing down. Why? What's wrong? Speed's increasing! Reversing again. We are going to roll out! Why? I don't know. At 7.44 local time, S7 Airlines Flight 778 overruns the runway and crashes through a concrete barrier, hitting a group of private garages and bursts into flames killing 125 people. Miraculously, 78 people survived. After the crash, all was left was a part of the tail section and the remains of the wing. It became Russia's fourth worst air accident and the A310's third worst air accident. Unfortunately, when the plane came to a stop, almost everyone was still alive. Only one person died because of trauma from the impact. But the rest of the people died because of acute carbon monoxide poisoning. It's really unfortunate that they died after the impact. Why did this flight end in a disaster? Let's find out together. So, why did this plane overrun the runway? There are six factors that can cause this. One, short runway. Two, late touchdown. Three, wind direction. Four, insufficient braking. 5. Mechanical malfunction and 6. Pilot error. Let's start with factor number 1. Short runway. Was the runway short? Well, the answer is no, it was not. Irkutsk International Airport with its 3.5 km runway is more than able to safely land an A310 without problems. So factor number 1 is out. Let's go to factor number 2. A late touchdown. There have been a lot of crashes that have happened because of late touchdowns. But for this crash, it was not the case. The captain landed perfectly on the max, giving them enough space to stop. So this is ruled out as well. Let's go to factor number three, wind direction. The direction of the wind really matters when landing. To understand this, we need to know the three wind directions. One, a tailwind. Two, a headwind, three, a crosswind. A crosswind is when the wind's direction is almost perpendicular to the plane's heading. A tailwind is when the wind is going at the same heading as the plane. This can be dangerous because it can increase the stall speed when landing, which means planes will need to land at a higher speed than normal. A headwind is when the wind is going in the opposite direction of the plane's heading. This is the best choice when landing because it allows the plane to fly slower. Unfortunately, at the time of the crash, there was a headwind of 15 knots, so the wind direction is ruled out. Let's go to factor number four, insufficient braking. Insufficient braking can be caused by three things. One, a worn out brake. Two, the lack of all the braking equipment. Three, a slippery runway. At the accident site, the investigators checked and found out that the carbon brakes on the A310 were not worn out and were in good condition. Looking at the flight data recorder, it showed us that all braking equipment were working, except for one. It's only the left engine reverser that was not working. The plane can still operate normally with just one reverser. A slippery runway can cause hydroplaning and make the plane not stop faster. It was raining that day and the runway was wet. But the wetness was not strong enough to make the plane not stop. There was still a level of friction on the runway. But we can determine that insufficient braking played a small role in this crash. So let's go to factor number five, 
mechanical malfunction. A mechanical malfunction is dangerous because it can appear at the wrong time and unwanted. The left engine reverser was deactivated due to the airlines not having enough spare parts. But checking the flight data recorder, the investigators noticed that after the plane landed, moments later, the left engine started increasing in power gradually until it reached 60% of power all the way until impact. What could have done this? Checking the engine was a waste of time as it was found to be in fine condition. The captain landed the plane in full manual mode, so the auto throttle was disengaged. Did it operate on its own without the pilot's notice? To know more about this, the investigators contacted Airbus to see if they can find anything regarding the auto throttle. But after the investigation, Airbus concluded that it was impossible for the auto throttle to operate on its own without the pilot's command. So, in other words, there was no mechanical malfunction. So the only way for the power to increase is if the pilots themselves increase it manually. But why did they do so? Let's go to the final factor. 6. Pilot error. The only reason as to why the left engine started increasing in power is possible if the pilots increased it manually. But why would a highly experienced pilot do that when landing? It goes against any training or logic. After analyzing the cockpit voice recorder and flight data recorder, we find out that both pilots made critical errors that doomed this flight. Let's begin with the captain. After touching down normally, everything was still normal. Engine 1 was at idle and engine 2 was set to reverse power. All as planned. But moments later, because of the position of the throttle and his hands, the captain started to reduce the reverse power on engine 2. But at the same time, it's possible that his palm started to increase engine 1's power all the way to 60%. From there until impact, he never knew what was going on. As for the co-pilot, during the whole approach and landing, he never made any mandatory callouts which he was supposed to be doing. He was not monitoring the instruments to notice power increase in engine 1. So why did the pilots react like this? It all comes down to three things. One. The pilots fell into a state of premature mental demobilization. It is characterized by a decrease in pilot alertness. Basically, the crew thought that everything was over since they had landed. 2. They had low experience on the A310. The crew was used to the good old TU-154. And the philosophy of the TU-154 is completely different from the A310. On the TU-154, you cannot fly with one reversal not working and the flight engineer is the one that watches over the engines. And in stressful situations, a person tends to go back to roles that he is familiar with. 3. They were not well known with crew resource management training. Like I said, they were used to the TU-154. On the TU-154, the flight engineer is usually the one who deals with engine-related things. As things started getting worse, they became stressed and reverted to what they know best. They knew that at that moment, the flight engineer would resolve the engine problem, but there was no flight engineer. It's believed that the captain was not able to recognize that he's the one that increased the engine power because of the shakes and vibration which were typical for the runway at Irkutsk. Since the A310 was a bit old, it was easy to move the throttles because the bearings had become a bit loose. So, with this information, let us see how the chains of events unfolded. At 21.17 local time in Moscow at Domodedov International Airport, A7 Airlines Flight 778 takes off for its 5-hour flight to Irkutsk with the left engine reverser deactivated. The climb, cruise and descent is uneventful and so at 7.39 local time, A7 Airlines Flight 778 establishes itself on the approach for Irkutsk Runway 30. The weather was not good but the captain safely brings the heavy jet to the ground. He immediately releases the right engine reverser, slowing down the jet. But because of the long night, the crew falls into a state of premature mental demobilization, making them too relaxed. Seconds later, at 100 knots, the captain starts to reduce the right engine reverse power, but he is unaware that his palm starts to increase the left engine all the way until 60%. Both pilots start getting confused. The captain puts full brakes, but that only stabilizes the speed at 98 knots to 100 knots and punctures a tire. 
as the end of the runway starts to approach faster, the crew starts to get stressed and they revert to what they know best. Since they have a lot of experience on the TU-154, they now expect the flight engineer to deal with the engine issue. But there's no flight engineer on the A310. With stress and confusion clouding their minds, the A310 overruns the runway, crashes through a concrete barrier, hitting a group of private garages and bursts into flames. Sadly, this was not the first time that this has happened. On March the 3rd, 1999, an Uzbekistan Airways A310 overruns the runway due to the same reason. On March the 3rd, 2004, a Biman Bangladesh Airlines A310 also overruns the runway due to the same reason. On March the 8th, 2005, a year before this crash, a Mahan Air A310 overruns the runway due to the same reason. Of these three, there were no casualties. It is only this crash that has casualties. There have been other similar cases but with a little bit of differences, like Tem Airlines Flight 3054. Link in the description if you want to see it. After the incident, the investigators recommended that A310 pilots not use reverse thrust at all if one reverser is deactivated and to improve crew resource management training. May the lost souls rest in peace. Thanks for watching this video of Men's from Disaster. If you noticed, you will see that the voices in the reconstructions were a bit different from the others. That's the level that I want this channel to reach. So please, please subscribe to the channel to join us and to support us on our journey to 1k sub and more. If you want to watch other videos of Minutes from Disaster, you can click them on your screen right now. See you next week. Bye.